What do you love most about this time of the year, when everything is just beginning to bud and blossom, and the air is filled with birdsong and the sweet scents of spring? I don't know about you, but one of the things I really love about this time of year, especially in Scotland, is seeing all the bluebells and the daffodils and the cute baby lambs. Hello everyone, I'm Kathleen Pelly. Welcome to the special omnibus edition of Journey with Story, where we are offering you all of this month's episodes in one place. One of the many things I love about good stories is that they can help you love the world a little more, help you see what is important about this life, and help you to be grateful for all the beauty that surrounds us. Oh, mums and dads and grown-ups, When I go to schools to talk about the importance of reading aloud to our children, I like to share this beautiful African proverb with parents and teachers. What we teach a child to love is more important than what we teach a child to learn. Thanks to all of you who are teaching your children to love stories. For this love of stories, I believe, helps our little ones to live life more joyfully, compassionately and creatively. Now, let's take an omnibus journey with story. Now, let's take a journey with the frog princess. Oh, there is a word here you might not know. Flax. Flax is a plant that is spun into a thread that makes a material called linen that we use for clothing. Oh, there is one other word towards the end. Enigmatic. But I'm not going to tell you what that word means because I think most of you will be able to guess its meaning from the rest of the story. Once long ago, there was a peasant woman who had three sons. Though they were peasants, they were well off, for the soil on which they lived was fruitful and yielded rich crops. One day, the sons told their mother they wished to get married. Do as you like, said their mother, but see that you choose good housewives. To make certain of this, she gave each of them a skin of flax for their intended wives to spin, saying, Whoever spins the best will be my favourite daughter-in-law. Now, the two eldest sons had already chosen the girl they would marry, so they took the flax from their mother and carried it off with them to have it spun by their intended wives. But the youngest son didn't know what to do with his skin, for he was shy and a little slow and had never spoken to a girl. He wandered hither and thither, shyly asking girls that he met if they would spin the flax he carried. But they laughed in his face and mocked him. In despair, he left the village and went into the countryside. He sat down on the bank of a pond and began to cry. Suddenly there was a splash beside him and a frog, a female talking frog of course, jumped out of the water onto the bank beside him. Why are you crying? she asked. The youth told her how his brothers would bring home linen spun by their promised wives but that he could find no one to spin his flax. Oh, do not weep said the frog kindly. Give me the thread and I will spin it for you. She took the flax and flopped back into the water. The youngest son didn't know what to make of this, so he went back home. A few days later, the two eldest brothers returned with the linen that had been spun by their chosen wives. The youngest brother didn't know what else to do but run back to the pond and start to cry again. Flop! The frog splashed out of the water close beside him. She was a compassionate as well as a talking frog. Here is the linen that I have spun for you, 
she said. Wow, what a frog! The linen was beautiful. The youngest ran straight to his mother, who declared she had never seen linen so beautifully spun, better by far than the linen spun by the other two. At that, she turned to her sons and said, "I need more proof of the sort of wives you have chosen, my sons. We have three new puppies. I want each of you to take one and give it to the woman you mean to marry. She must train it and bring it up. Whichever dog turns out the best, its mistress will be my favourite daughter-in-law." So all the three young men set out with their puppies in their different directions. The youngest, not knowing where else to go, returned to the pond, and sat there puzzled. Flop! Up beside him splashed the frog. Why are you here? She asked. He told her of his mother's newest challenge. Oh, give the puppy to me! She said, and I will bring it up for you. When she saw that the young man hesitated, she simply took the puppy out of his arms. And flopped back into the pond with it. The youngest son was somewhat surprised, but as he did not know what else to do, he went home. Weeks and months passed till one day the mother said she would like to see how the dogs had been trained by her future daughters-in-law. The two eldest sons departed and returned shortly, leading two. Great mastiffs who growled so fiercely and looked so savage that the mere sight of them made the mother tremble with fear. The youngest son ran to the pond and called the frog. Flop! Up splashed the frog, holding the most adorable little dog. It sat up and begged with its paws and did pretty tricks. In high spirits, the young man ran off to his mother. As soon as she saw it, she exclaimed, oh, "This is the most beautiful little dog I have ever seen! You are indeed fortunate, my son. You have found a pearl of a wife. But there must be one more test. Take these three shirts to your chosen wives. Whoever creates the loveliest embroidery on them." Will be my favourite daughter-in-law. So once more the three set out, and of course this time, the work of the frog was by far the most beautiful. Now that I am content with the tests, said the mother, fetch home your brides, and I will prepare the wedding feast. What was the youngest son to do? Where would he find a bride? Perhaps the frog could help him again. He went to the edge of the pond and called her. Flop! Once more, the faithful frog splashed up beside him. Oh, what is troubling you? She asked him. The youth told her he needed a wife. Well, marry me, she said. What should I do with you as a wife? He replied. He didn't mean to be rude, but it was, after all, a strange proposal, even for a fairy tale. Will you have me, or will you not? She demanded. I will neither have you nor will I refuse you. He answered, which was a rather enigmatic answer. At this, the frog disappeared. The next minute, a charming little chariot drawn by two tiny ponies stood in the road. The frog was in the chariot, lounging against velvet pillows. "Hop in," she said. So he did. As they drove along the road, they met three witches. The first of them was blind. The second was hunchbacked. And the third had a large thorn in her throat. <laughs> When the three witches saw the little chariot drawn by the tiny horses, with the frog seated pompously on the cushions, they broke into such fits of laughter that the eyelids of the blind one.
burst open and she recovered her sight. The hunchback rolled about on the ground in such merriment her back became straight and in a roar of laughter the thorn was thrust out of the throat of the third witch. Their first thought was to reward the frog who had been the means of their cures after all. The first witch waved her magic wand over the frog and changed her into the loveliest girl that had ever been seen. The second witch waved the wand over the tiny chariot and ponies and they were turned into a beautiful large carriage with prancing horses and a coachman. The third witch gave the girl a magic purse filled with money. Having done this, the witches disappeared. <laughs> and the youth, with his lovely bride, drove home. Great was the delight of the mother at the good fortune of her youngest son, whose wife, incidentally, became their favourite daughter-in-law, of course. And did they all live happily ever after? Well, that's another frog story. Now, let's take an encore journey with Izzy, Izzy, Princess Izzy. I wish I was a princess, announced Izzy as Papa tucked her into bed. Well, there are all sorts of princesses in this world, Papa said. What sort of princess do you want to be? A long-ago storybook princess, cried Izzy, with a puffy petticoat and a frilly frock. Don't forget the sparkly crown, Papa added, or the gaggle of servants. Oh, yes, yes, squealed Izzy, jumping up and down. But, said Papa as he tucked her up again, this sort of princess can be a bit bossy and horribly haughty, not at all like you. Really? said Izzy as she lined up Teddy and Walrus and Piggy in a nice, neat row, just the way she liked. Well, maybe I could be a fairy princess and live in a fairy fort at the edge of the forest. And ride on unicorns, added Papa, through dusky dells and misty moonbeams. Izzy fluttered her arms like wings. Izzy, Izzy, fairy princess, she chanted, and her eyes sparkled like thin dust. But, said Papa with a shake of his head, fairies like to make mischief and stir up trouble. They vanish quickly and cannot be counted upon. Not at all like you, Izzy sighed. Oh, I suppose that is so. She hummed a tune to help her think. Then she reached beneath the bed and pulled out Parrot. What about a pirate princess? she asked. That might be fun, Papa agreed. You could sail the seven seas with your swashbuckling crew and your chatterbox parrot. Why, you could make sharks shiver and crocodiles quake. <gasps> Izzy, Izzy, Pirate Princess, Izzy sang as she bounced up and down on her pirate boat bed. Wait, said Papa, I don't think that will work either. Pirate princesses do not get seasick. They have horrible manners, are greedy for treasure, and they will quarrel and squabble over nothing at all. Definitely not like you. Oh, definitely not, agreed Izzy. But Papa... I still want to be a princess. 
Isn't there some sort of princess I could be? Papa stroked Izzy's hair. Well, there is another kind of princess. She wears jeans or skirts like me, Izzy asked. Papa nodded. And for dinner she likes pizza or pakoras. Like me? Izzy asked again. And again Papa nodded. Then he pressed his fingers to his lips and he whispered, She is a secret princess. And you will know her by her happy heart and mighty deeds. Mighty deeds? repeated Izzy. So if there was a bully at the bus stop bothering a little person, continued Papa, this secret princess would use her special steely stare and frosty frown to send that bully on his way and all would be well in the kingdom of the bus stop. Izzy giggled. That was my mighty deed, she said. Papa smiled. I know. And if there was a classroom catastrophe, like last week, chimed in Izzy, when Ava Pritchard brought her kitty cat for show and tell and it got loose and... Exactly so, said Papa. And someone I know used her secret princess quick wits and heart of gold to rush to the rescue and all was well in the kingdom of the classroom. That was my mighty deed too, said Izzy. Papa smiled and nodded. Yes, it was. And tonight, when a certain mama was a little cranky, a certain secret princess used her sunny song and helping hands until all was well. In the kingdom of our house, piped up Izzy. Exactly so, agreed Papa. Then Papa and Izzy sat side by side on the edge of the bed. Together they wondered at the night sky, as they liked to do. Then Izzy leaned into Papa, and Papa cradled her head with his hand the way she liked, because it made her feel safe and brave. An owl hooted. The wind whispered through the treetops. The leaves rustled like princess petticoats. Papa, do you really think I'm a secret princess? I know you are, he said. Then Papa tucked her into bed one last time. He bent down long and whispered her name, all hushed and holy, like a prayer. Izzy, Izzy, night, night, my secret princess. Night, night, Papa, she said, and she sailed off to sleep with her happy heart, dreaming of mighty deeds to sparkle the world so that all would be well in the kingdom of Izzy, Izzy, secret princess. Now, let's take a journey with Juan Bobo and the Robbers. Once upon a time, many years ago, there was a boy who was so lazy that he seemed stupid. Although he really tried to behave himself, he did nothing but say and do silly things. That is why the whole world, except his intelligent and hard-working mother, called him Juan Bobo. Bobo means foolish or simple in Spanish. Go to the market in town and sell a fat chicken. With the money you receive, buy a bag of rice, Juan Bobo's mom instructed him. And be courteous and obedient with every person you encounter. See, mama, replied Juan Bobo. Seeing this, Juan took the chicken and happily left to go to the market. 
Soon he encountered a lot of people. Half of them came in a carriage, and the other half were riding horses. They had come from a wedding. Walking along the road were the groom, the bride, the family members, and the friends who were riding horses. You have my deepest condolences, said Juan. Now, the reason that he talked to them in this way was that on the one occasion he had been with his mother at a funeral and because she had greeted the family in that manner, Juan thought that you had to give this greeting any time you saw a procession of people. Naturally, the newlyweds, as well as the friends, became very angry. Next time you encounter a group of people, you have to greet them waving your hat and saying, Viva, Viva, said the angry husband. Thank you very much, that's what I will do, said Juan. So the boy kept on walking. And soon he encountered a butcher and his three sons. They had come back from the market bringing some pigs that they had bought. Remembering the words that the groom had told him, Juan greeted them with a hearty Viva, Viva, as he waved his hat in the air. The pigs were frightened by the hat waving and by the yelling, causing them to run in all directions towards the fields. You stupid boy! exclaimed the butcher. Next time you see something similar, it is better to say, I hope God gives you two for each one. Thank you very much, that's what I will do. Near the market, Juan saw a farmer who was burning a pile of weeds that he had taken out of his field. Remembering what the butcher had told him, Juan greeted him, saying, I hope God gives you two for each one. What is it, son? You shouldn't say that, said the farmer. Well, what should I say, senor? Next time you see something like this, it is best that you help, instead of saying silly things. Thank you very much. That's what I will do. He kept on walking, thinking that he was born to make mistakes. Soon he saw two big and strong men who were fighting in the middle of the road. He remembered what the farmer had advised him and he ran at them yelling, Wait, wait, let me help you. When they saw the boy, the men stopped fighting and started to laugh. Ha, you shouldn't say that, said one of the men. So what should I say? You should say, please don't fight, replied the men. Thank you very much, that's what I will do. Seeing this, Juan continued on his way. When he got to the market, he sold the chicken and bought the bag of rice following the instructions his mother had given him. Then he walked happily around the market. He observed potters making and decorating beautiful pictures, big and small. In awe he watched the glass blowers, and he was sad that he didn't have the money to buy a flower vase for his mother. Finally Juan left the market. He headed home. But soon he felt tired and he climbed into a big tree to take a siesta. He settled into a big branch and soon fell asleep. While he was sleeping, the sky turned dark and a storm came in. It started drizzling. The sound of the rain and a murmur of voices woke him up. He saw two thieves were taking refuge below the tree, but they couldn't see him. One of the thieves deposited a big pile of gold coins on the ground. Here we will be safe from the rain, said the other thief. Nobody will see us while we count the money we stole. Don't be stupid, Paco, replied the first thief. We shouldn't count the money until tonight. Ah, bah, 
said Paco, and he hit the other thief with his fist. Please don't fight, said Juan Bobo. As he spoke, the sack of rice broke. Help, help, it is hailing, yelled Paco. The god of the storm has discovered us. Run, run. And the two bandits ran away hurriedly, abandoning the treasure. Juan climbed down from the tree and quickly picked up the bounty, which he put in his cloak. Then whistling a happy song, he ran towards home. Here I am, Mama, and I bring you a present. Look at all these gold coins I have under my cloak. Aha, my dear Juanito, we are rich, said his mum. But explain to me what happened. There is nothing to explain, Mama. It is easy to get rich if a person is courteous and obedient with everybody. Let's take a journey with where stories come from, a traditional Zulu tale. Once a very long time ago, so long ago that it must have been close to the time when the first man and the first woman walked upon the earth, there lived a woman named Ma'an Zandaba and her husband Zian Zali. They lived in a traditional home in a small traditional village. They had many children and for the most part they were very happy. They would spend the day working, weaving baskets, tanning hides, hunting and tilling the earth near their home. On occasion they would go down to the great ocean and play under the sun and the sand laughing at the funny crabs they would see scuttling along there and rejoicing at the way in which the birds would dip and dive in the sea breezes. Zain Zale had the heart of an artist and loved to carve. He would fashion beautiful birds out of the old tree stumps. With his axe, he could make the most wonderful impala and kudu bucks from stone. Their homestead was filled with decorative works by Zian Zili, the carver. But in the evenings, when the family would sit around the fire before going to sleep, they would not be so happy. It was too dark for weaving or carving, and yet too early to go to sleep. Mama, the children would cry, we want stories. Tell us some stories, Mama. Martin Zadaba would think and think, trying to find a story she could tell her children, but it was of no use. She and Zian Zili had no stories to tell. They sought the counsel of their neighbours, but none of them knew any stories. They listened to the wind. Could the wind be trying to tell them a story? No, they heard nothing. There were no stories. No dreams, no magical tales. One day, Zayn Zeli told his wife that she must go in search of stories. He promised to look after the home, to care for the children, to mend and wash and sweep and clean, if only she would bring back stories for the people. Manzan Daba agreed. She kissed her husband and children goodbye and set off in search of stories. The woman decided to ask every creature she passed if they had stories to share. The first animal she met was the hare. He was such a trickster, but she thought she'd better ask him all the same. Hare, do you have any stories? My people are hungry for tales. Stories, shrieked Hare. Why, I have hundreds, 
thousands, no millions of them. Oh, please, hare, begged Mams and Daba. Give some to me that we might be happy. Um, hare said, well, I have no time for stories now. Can't you see that I am terribly busy? Stories in the daytime, indeed. And hare hopped quickly away. Silly hare, he was lying. He didn't have any stories. With a sigh, Mans and Daba continued on her way. The next one she came upon was Mother Baboon with her babies. Oh, Mother Baboon, she called. I see you are a mother also. My children are crying for stories. Do you have any stories that I could bring back to them? Stories, laughed the Baboon. Do I look like I have time to tell stories? With so much work to do to keep my children fed and safe and warm, do you think I have time for stories? I am glad that I do not have human children who cry for such silly things. Mans and Daba continued on her way. She then saw an owl in a wild fig tree. Oh, owl, she called. Please, will you help me? I am looking for stories. Do you have any stories you could give me to take back to my home? Well, the owl was most perturbed at having been woken from her sleep. Who is making noise in my ears? She hooted. What is this disruption? What do you want, stories? You dare wake me for stories? How rude! And with that, the owl flew off to another tree and perched much higher, where she believed she would be left in peace. Soon she was sound asleep again, and Mans and Daba went sadly on her way. Next she came upon an elephant. Oh, kind elephant, she asked, do you know where I might find some stories? My people are hungry for some tales, and we do not have any. Now, the elephant was a kind animal. He saw the look in the woman's eye and felt immediately sorry for her. Dear woman, he said, I do not know of any stories, but I do know the eagle. He is the king of the birds and flies much higher than all the rest. Don't you think that he might know where you could find stories? Kind elephant, she said. Thank you very, very much. So Mans and Daba began to search for the great fish eagle. She found him near the mouth of the Tugela River. Excitedly, she ran toward him. She called out to him as he was swooping down from the sky, talons outstretched to grab a fish from the river. Great fish eagle, she called. She so startled the eagle that he dropped the fish that had been his. He circled around and landed on the shore near the woman. Ah, he barked at her. What is so important that you cause me to lose my supper? Oh, great and wise eagle, began Mans and Daba. Now, fish eagle is very vain. He liked hearing this woman refer to him as great and wise. He puffed out his feathers as she spoke. Great eagle, my people are hungry for stories. I have been searching a long time now for tales to bring back to them. Do you know where I might find such tales? She gave him a great look of desperation. Well, he said, even though I am quite wise, I do not know everything. I only know of the things that are here on the face of the earth. But there is one who knows even the secrets of the deep, dark ocean. Perhaps he could help you. I will try and call him for you. Stay here. Wait for me. So Mans and Daba waited several days for her friend, the fish eagle, to return. Finally, he came back to her and he called. 
I have returned, and I am successful. My friend, the big sea turtle, has agreed to take you to a place where you can find stories. And with that, the great sea turtle lifted himself out of the ocean. Climb onto my back, said the sea turtle in his deep voice, and hold on to my shell. I will carry you to the land of the spirit people. So the woman took hold of his shell, and down they went into the depths of the sea. The woman was quite amazed. She had never seen such beautiful things before in her life. Finally, they came to the bottom of the ocean where the spirit people dwell. The sea turtle took her straight to the thrones of the king and queen. They were so regal. Mans and Daba was a bit afraid at first to look at them, but then she bowed down before them. What do you wish of us, woman from the dry lands? they asked. So Mans and Daba told them of her desire to bring stories to her people. Do you have stories that I could take to them? she asked rather shyly. Yes, they said. We have many stories. But what will you give us in exchange for those stories, Mans and Daba? What do you desire? Mans and Daba asked. What we would really like, they said, is a picture of your home and your people. We can never go to the dry lands, but it would be so nice to see that place. Can you bring us a picture, Mans and Daba? Oh, yes, she answered. I can do that. Thank you, thank you. So Mans and Daba climbed back onto the turtle's shell and he took her back to the shore. She thanked him profusely and asked him to return with the next round moon to collect her and the picture. The woman told her family all the things she had seen and experienced on her journey. When she finally got to the end of the tale, her husband cried out with delight. I can do that. I can carve a beautiful picture in wood for the spirit people in exchange for their stories. And he set to work straight away. Manzandaba was so proud of her husband and the deftness of his fingers. She watched him as the picture he carved came to life. There were the members of their family, their home and their village. Soon others in the community heard about Manzandaba's journey and the promised stories. And they came also to watch Zee and Zeely's creation take shape. When the next round moon showed her face, Zee and Zeely was ready. He carefully tied the picture to Manzandaba's back. She climbed on the turtle's back and away they went to the spirit kingdom. When they saw the picture, the king and queen of the spirit people were so happy they praised Zee and Zeli's talent and gave Manz and Daba a special necklace made of the finest shells for her husband and thanks. And then they turned to Manz and Daba herself. For you and your people, they said, we give the gift of stories. And they handed her the largest and most beautiful shell she had ever seen. Whenever you want a story, they said, just hold this shell to your ear and you will have your tale. Mans and Daba thanked them for their extreme kindness and headed back to her own world. When she arrived at the shore, there to meet her was her own family and all the people of her village. They sat around a huge fire and called out, Tell us a story, Mans and Daba. Tell us a story. So she sat down, put the shell to her ear, and began. 
once upon a time. And that is how stories came to be. Which one of these stories did you love the most? Don't forget to check our blog posts where you can find some discussion questions and background information on our featured story of the month. Just go to www.journeywithstory.com and click on the blog tab. You can see the link in our episode notes too. Here's to stories that help us all to live life more joyfully, compassionately and creatively. Cheerio then, join me next time for Journey with Story. Music and post-production was by Colette Jonas.